The following program is a production of Truth for the World. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. What does the Bible really teach on marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Hello and welcome to the program, Words to Live By. In this series of programs, we are examining the home and the family. And while this topic is too broad and vast for us to be able to cover every scenario or potential idea for discussion, we do hope to give you God's instructions for the home and family and thus give you words to live by. You can then take these words and use them as your rules and guidelines to follow when making decisions about your own situations regarding the home and family. In reality, the home and family are under attack today. As we have begun to see in our previous programs, there are those who would dismantle the home and family by breaking down God's plan for marriage and God's appointed roles for us in the family and home. We continue looking at threats to the home and family with this lesson called Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. In our last program, Cliff Goodwin began looking at five questions from God's Word about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. The questions are, what is the law? What is the problem? What is the solution? What about the children? And what are we trying to do? In the first program, Cliff covered what the law of God is on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. The law is one man and one woman for life. Divorce is only allowed for one exception, and that is adultery. The innocent party in the marriage may remarry after a divorce, but the guilty party may not. Then he looked at what the problem is. The problem is man goes contrary to God's law. In this program, he will look at what the solution is. Then he will also cover the questions, what about the children, and what are we trying to do? We invite you to open your Bibles and study along with the program today. Let's continue our current lesson in the category of lessons dealing with threats to the home and family. Open your Bibles with us now as Cliff Goodwin leads us in our study called Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. And the solution to the sin of adultery is the same as it is to the, for the solution of any other sin. And that is repentance. Repent. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, he said, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is longsuffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's solution for every sin problem is that all men come to repentance. And He desires that, and not only does He desire that, He has commanded that. In Acts 17 and verse 30, Paul preached to the Athenians, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Dear brother, dear sister, dear friend, if you're living in adultery tonight, or if you know someone who is living in adultery tonight, that command is still theirs. That solution is still available to them to repent, to come out of sin, and to be saved by the grace of our loving God. It's interesting in Matthew chapter 1 when the heavenly messenger was speaking to Joseph. It's interesting what the heavenly messenger said to Joseph about his soon to be born earthly son, Jesus, actually whom he did not father biologically, we understand. He said, And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Friends, that's significant. Jesus did not come to save His people in their sins. He came to save His people from their sins. That's very important. Matthew 1 and verse 21. So let's talk about repentance now as being the solution to this problem, the problem of adultery. What does repentance mean? It is translated from a compound Greek word. A compound word derived from meta, a prepositional, meaning to change, and then noia, a form of noose, which means the mind. And so literally when we speak of repentance, we mean a changing of one's mind. 
And in this vein, sometimes we call it the changing of one's heart. For biblically speaking, the heart of man is not right here. Biblically speaking, the spiritual heart is right here. It's the mind of man. Proverbs 4, 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And so repentance has been accurately described, and I'm going to show you from the scriptures why it's accurate, but it has been accurately described as a change of mind resulting in a reformation of life. And brothers and sisters, contrary to what kind of liberal theology has come down the pike, contrary to whatever you maybe have heard elsewhere, the Word of God teaches that a person cannot repent and continue living in the same sinful fashion. That is not taught in God's Word, and I want to show you that. In God's Word instead, when a person repents up here between the ears, Repentance occurs between the ears. And when it has occurred up here between the ears, evidence of it is manifested out in the life. And I will show you that. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21. As you're turning there, another practical definition that I like to use for repentance is a conscious, uh, a conscious decision of the will. Repentance is a conscious decision decision of the will wherein a man or a woman says, I do not want to live in sin anymore. I want to get out of the sinning business. I'm turning away from sin and I'm turning to my God and to my Lord. That's repentance. Now let's look in Matthew 21 and verse 28 at what our Lord taught along these lines. Jesus asked, but what think ye? A certain man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. Here notice the son initially was very impudent, very stubborn. He rebels against his father. He says, I'm not going to go work in your vineyard today, Dad. I will not. But then the Bible says, but afterward, now notice the twofold progression, and they're both essential. Number one, he repented. That occurred between his ears. Number one, he repented. Number two, he reformed his action. He went. Now friends, not 99% of the time, but 110% of the time, as I like to say often, repentance will result in reformation of life. He repented and went. He did what he was told to do. Let's look at another verse along these lines. Turn with me over to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, one of the later uh, occurrences in the life of the Apostle Paul. Notice in Acts 26, verse 20, Paul here is standing before King Agrippa and he's telling him about his labors, his preaching and teaching. He says, But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. My, there's a mouthful right there. Paul says, I was preaching at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea. And he says, I've even gone preaching to the Gentiles, number one, that they should repent. They have a conscious decision of the will that they're going to change. Number two, they turn to God. Now, turning to God necessitates, as well as implies, a turning away from sin. And so they've made this change of mind. They're turning away from sin, turning to God. But now the last phrase is the kicker. And do works meet for repentance. Friends, you've got to change the way you behave. You've got to change the way you act. You've got to change your life. It's got to be a reformation of life or it is not the fullness of repentance. Now the reason all of that is so applicable and so pertinent to our discussion regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage is because sometimes the question arises, well, preacher, I see what you're saying. I understand Matthew 19. I understand Romans 7. I know that I'm living in adultery. I know that. But I, I want you to know that I'm repenting of that in my heart and I, I'm going to thereafter be able to stay with my spouse, my adulterous spouse. No, you're not. And I'm saddened to say that. Now, please understand, I don't find any glee in, in having to deal with these matters. But my work as a gospel preacher is to save souls. 
And I don't save anybody by candy coating and distorting the truth, thereby allowing them to perish in a devil's hell. I don't save anybody that way. It's only the truth which makes men free, John 8 and verse 32. You need to hear the truth. I need to hear the truth. And the truth of it is you cannot stay in that adulterous union and be pleasing unto God. I know you can't. Let's see why. Turn over now to Matthew chapter 14. We're still talking about the solution. The solution is repentance. Repentance means you change your mind toward this sin of adultery, and it also means you get out of that adulterous marital relationship. Okay? The state, the government, has sanctioned it as a marriage. God, however, has never sanctioned it as a marriage. He has divinely called it adultery. Romans 7 and verse 3. Now, in Matthew chapter 14, I think's the place to which I directed you, we have the account of John the baptizer. And actually here we see that marriage, divorce, and remarriage, in effect, was the subject which caused John to lose his head. And it's sad today, I hate to say today, but marriage, divorce, and remarriage, when preached faithfully right out of the Word of God, has caused many a preacher today to lose his head. If not literally, to lose his head occupationally. That is, to lose his job. Because he's preached the truth on these matters. But notice with me here in Matthew 14, verse 3. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. Now I want you to get this clear in verse 3 there. Herodias is Herod's brother's, Philip's wife. That's hard to say. But Herod's brother, Philip, Herodias was his wife. All right? For John said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have her. Now, Matthew maybe is not as clear as Mark is. Turn over to Mark chapter 6, and that's where I had turned a moment ago. And I want you to notice what has happened here. Herodias apparently was rightfully married to Philip. She was Philip's wife, as we read in Matthew 14 verse 3. But Herod had taken Herodias, and he had married her for himself. Now notice this in Mark chapter 6 and verse 17. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, but, now notice, for he had married her. Friends, even back in the days of the New Testament era, sometimes the government would allow you to contract a marriage that God wouldn't. Herod being the king, he was the government. <laughs> Herod could pretty much marry anybody he wanted to. He was the government. But here he had sanctioned a marriage for himself that God did not honor. And friends, today the state of Kentucky, the state of Alabama, the state of Tennessee, all 50 states, they may issue, a piece, issue you a piece of paper telling you that you're sanctioned to get married in their state. But that doesn't mean God necessarily sanctions that marriage. If thereby you enter into adultery, I'll just tell you straight up, God doesn't sanction that marriage. Regardless of what the state of Kentucky, the state of Alabama, or anybody else says. Now notice here in Mark 6 and verse 18, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Now friends, don't miss this point. If it was not lawful for Herod to have his brother Philip's wife the first night on their honeymoon, if it was adultery the first time they came together as husband and wife, then you tell me what changes the hundredth time they come together as husband and wife. Friends, if it was adultery the first time, it's still adultery. And that's why it's not lawful for him to have her. And that teaches you and me, brothers and sisters, the solution is repentance. Genuine, biblical repentance. Not some of this come-lately theology on so-called repentance, but what the Bible teaches about repentance. Change your mind, and accordingly, as needed, change your life. Get out of that adulterous relationship. So we've answered three of these questions. Let's go to the most difficult. And that is, what about the children? What about the children? You know, sometimes men and women make mistakes, bad mistakes, early in their lives before they have any children. They divorce on unscriptural grounds and then they later remarry, thereby entering into a state of adultery, according to Matthew 19.9. 9. 
And then in these second or subsequent marriages, they and this adulterous spouse, they have children together. And then years later, they realize they're living in adultery. They've got these children. What do we do? I know many of you, most of you up here in this part of the world, you don't know Cliff Goodwin. You don't know me from Adam's house cat. But those of you who do know me, I hope understand that my heart breaks for those people. My heart breaks for the mamas and the daddies. My heart breaks for the children, especially. The children are innocent. But friends, the fact of the matter is, from the Scriptures, the existence of children in that adulterous union does not change the principle that is involved. If mother and father are living in adultery with children or without children, they're living in adultery when they have children. That does not change. You say, well, preacher, I just, I just don't know about this now. I mean, there, what kind of biblical evidence are you going on here? I want to show you a biblical precedent. I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament. Particularly, I want you to turn to the book of Ezra. In Ezra's day, near the close of this book, there were people in Israel, people in the promised land, actually Judah, who had returned from the captivity. And these people had transgressed the law of Moses under which they were living by marrying strange or Gentile wives. Now notice this in Ezra chapter 10 and verse 10. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now under the Mosaic legislation, Deuteronomy chapter 7 in particular, among other passages in the Pentateuch, it was sinful for the ancient Israelites to marry Gentiles, to marry non-believing pagan Gentiles. It was sinful. And yet some of these returnees here in the promised land now after the captivity, they had done just that. They were, they were living in unscriptural marriages. Now, not necessarily unscriptural in the same sense that we think of unscriptural today, but don't lose sight of the fact it is an unscriptural marriage, period. For whatever reason made it unscriptural, it's still unscriptural. And notice verse 11. He says, Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do His pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land. Now notice, here Ezra is telling them point blank, and separate yourselves from the strange wives. Ezra said you didn't have a right to marry those women the day you did it. You don't have a right to be married to those women today, years later perhaps. And he says you need to repent and you need to separate yourselves from the strange wives whom you've married unscripturally because of Deuteronomy 7. Five minutes, Brother Moser says. Let's move down to the last part of chapter 10. I want you to read the last verse in this book, Ezra 10 and verse 44. After giving a lengthy list, a relatively lengthy list of men who were guilty in this trespass, the book closes, all these had taken strange wives and some of them had wives by whom they had children. Friends, their having children did not change the principle involved. And that is they were in unscriptural marriages and they were to, to dissolve those unions and to get out of them. You say, well Cliff, that's one of the coldest one of the most callous things I've ever heard preached. I don't think so. And my heart breaks for children in those situations. And you're, I'm not up here as a man who's never had to deal with this. I've had to sit across a bed from another man while at Christian camp one week. And I had to look that man in the eye after hearing his story and hearing his situation. And I had to tell that man, man to man, I had to tell him, you do not have a right to be with the mother of your children. And so this is not just theory for me, okay? This is something we have to put into practice. But let me tell you some reasons why it's not the coldest and the most callous thing ever. I want you to realize that there are some benefits that children can receive when mama and daddy have to separate because they're living in adultery. I want to give you three such benefits 
that those children in those pitiable situations enjoy probably unlike any other child in the world. Number one, they learn that the most important thing in life is going to heaven. If a man and a woman are living in adultery, why do they persist on living in that state? To be happy for maybe the next 20, maybe the next 30, maybe the next 40 or 50 years, they want to be happy. And so they insist on living in adultery. And any children born to that union, children who are educated in these matters, they're teaching those children day by day that going to heaven is not necessarily the most important thing. But children who have parents who have to separate because of what the Scriptures teach, those parents who do so, they give their children that lesson. That son or daughter, nothing is more important than going to heaven. And your mom and I know this, and we want to go to heaven, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Number two, parents who do this, even with children, show their children that they must respect the sanctity of the home. They teach their children that in vivid fashion. After all, what has gotten mama and daddy into this mess? Not having respected the sanctity of the home earlier in their lives. And yet when they do what the Bible teaches them to do, getting out of that adulterous relationship, they're teaching their children that you have to respect the sanctity of the home. When you grow up, son, when you grow up, daughter, don't make the same mistakes your mama and I made. Respect the sanctity of God's institution. And number three, they give their children a life lesson, an object lesson that is clear of Proverbs 13, 5. And that is the way of the transgressor is hard. And they teach their children that. Their children are able to see that. And hopefully their children are able to understand, you know what, I don't want to make these mistakes. And I do want to go to heaven more than anything else. Just like mama and daddy want to go to heaven. So what about the children? It's a lamentable situation. Pitiable indeed. And if you can just deal with it callously without your heart bleeding for those children, something's probably wrong with you. But friends, if we want to save the souls of mama and daddy, then we need to teach what the Bible teaches. Number five, and finally, my time I know is expired. The fifth and final question we need to ask ourselves is, what are we trying to do? If I could just be honest with you for a moment, I hope I've been honest with you the whole time. That's an expression. But let me be just frank and forthright with you here for a moment. Sometimes I think we who are members of the church, we need a serious reality check. Sometimes I think we have turned the Lord's church into little more than a social club at which to gather on Sunday mornings. In many congregations, we have done little more than kept house for the last 5, 10, 20, 30 years. And so I ask you tonight, what are we trying to do? Now the obvious answer from the Scriptures is, dear friends, we're trying to go to heaven. That's the answer. We're trying to go to heaven. We're not trying to ensure our happiness for the next 20 years, the next 30 years, the next 40 years, the next 50 years. I want to be happy the next 30 or 40 or 50 years, but I want to be happy in eternity. The next 40 or 50 years will come and go and sooner or later I'll lie in the dust. But my soul lives on and I want to be happy in eternity. And so if we're really trying to go to heaven, we've got to stand up and we've got to answer the hard questions. And we've got to stick to our guns on what the Bible says. And we've got to tell men and women what they need to hear. And that's the truth. And that may not necessarily be what they want to hear. But I ask you, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to do? Let's close our Bibles and take our song books out. Brother mentioned an invitation song a few moments ago. I appreciate your good patience and your attention this hour as we've considered marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and as we've answered these five questions, hopefully with the biblical perspective in each case. And friend, tonight, if you're here and you're not a Christian, I want to tell you the most important and the most glorious decision you could ever make is to name the name of Christ tonight and to put Him on in baptism. 
having placed your faith in Him, and having repented, truly repented, of your sins. Friend, if you haven't done those things, you need to do those things tonight. Brother or sister, if you have done those things in time past, only to wander, only to become unfaithful, then tonight we invite you to come home. Repent. Confess your sin, especially if it's publicly known. Come confessing, I have sinned publicly. And thereby allowing us to pray with you and to pray for you. And the Bible tells us that God will forgive you. 1 John 1 and verse 9. What are you trying to do tonight? I hope you're trying to go to heaven. I am. Even though we are looking at the physical home and family during the course of these programs, we must not forget to mention the spiritual family. The most important family of which you can be a member is the spiritual family of God. When we rebel against God's laws and do things our ways, it's sin, and the punishment for that sin is death or separation from God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is because of Jesus Christ that we can have eternal life instead of the death that we deserve. Jesus, who is God, came down to earth and lived a sinless life and gave himself as a perfect sacrifice of death to pay the penalty of sin for all mankind. If we accept that sacrifice on our behalf and have our sins washed away, we can return to God's presence after this life is over. How do you do that? How do you accept God's sacrifice? First, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Next, repent, in other words, turn away from your sinful ways and turn to God's laws and commandments and live following Him. Next, Confess our belief in Christ before others. That's simply stating you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Next, be immersed in water, baptized in order to have your sins washed away. And then finally, live faithfully following Christ and His commandments. Continue studying the Bible in order to grow and visit our website to take advantage of our materials to aid you in the study of God's Word. There you can find tracts, articles, Bible correspondence courses, radio TV programs at www.truthfortheworld.org. Well, make sure you're with us next time as we're going to continue our study on the home and family. Robert Taylor is going to be with us for a study of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, this chapter deals with the idea of being bound in marriage. Some have mistakenly pointed to this chapter as an extra option for divorce. So join us as we continue studying God's words to live by. If you would like to learn more about God's word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth For The World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America. Or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth for the World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world. Day by day and with each passing moment Strength I find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear